About 20 years ago, I found myself lost somewhere in northern Italy, the town of Brescia, the home of Pope John XXIII. I wandered into a trattoria, a restaurant, and there the old woman said, Americano? Si, senora. What city? Chicago, senora. Chicago, she said. Boom, 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 boom. No, senora. Chicago is more than that. Far, far more. is as natural to Chicago as a river that flows upwards. On any given Saturday, the sun is shining and the weather is right, you will find a Polish parade, a Mexican parade, a Croatian parade, a Puerto Rican parade, a Ukrainian parade, a Black Foot Dillican Day parade, and of course, the most celebrated of all, the St. Patrick's Day parade, which is often more than a display of pride, a not too subtle show of power. The Irish came here following the Germans, escaping the potato famines of the old country, singing sad songs, and counting pervasively those signs, no Irish need apply, and the paddy had to work with pick and shovel to earn his daily bread, and to find his way upwards very often, to see that light, he entered politics. Chicago politics for almost a century has been Irish in influence. For the past 40 years or so, our mayor successively, Kelly Kennelly, Daly Burns. And now new immigrants to the city, new people, the same old aspirations. The quest continues, and so does the march. <laughs> I've always thought that Chicago, the, the city motto, we have a city motto that means uh, uh, herbs and horto, which is a uh, city in a garden. And for years I've been uh, campaigning to have a change to ubi est mia, which means where's mine. <laughs> Mike Ryko, Chicago's most popular columnist, an observer of the human comedy that is Chicago. That's the Potawatomi Indian word for Wild onion. No, the, the, we've always had mayor saying this is the greatest city in the world. It's not. Uh, but it could be. Nelson Ogden described the city as being a city of uh, guys with dollar signs uh, for eyeballs. And it's still that way. Everybody who came here uh, came here to hustle a buck. Any way they could get it. I mean, they shafted the Indians. Uh, then they shafted the immigrants. Now the, uh, the white immigrants are now shafting the blacks if they can do it. And the blacks are looking around now to see who they can shaft <laughs> besides each other. Chicago Water Tower. One of the few survivors of the great Chicago fire of 1871. Not one of the showpieces of our town. When Oscar Wilde visited the city back in 1882, he took one look at that and said, what a castellated monstrosity with small pepper boxes stuck out all over. Rudyard Kipling, 10 years later, saw Chicago and said, having seen this city, I urgently desire never to see it again. It is inhabited by savages and gutter snipes. And Chicago is a city of working people who came to earn their daily bread in heavy industries, steel, packing, railroads, farm equipment. They came seeking more than bread, though. There always has been in this city this cockeyed wonder of a town a quest for beauty. Now, what would Oscar Wilde have said of this? Pablo Picasso's gift to Chicago. It came to our city about a hundred or so years after the water tower was built. August 15, 1967, the unveiling, the dedication ceremony. His Honor, Mayor Richard J. Daley himself spoke of Chicago's Picasso. And the people, there were hundreds here, who were observing this statue, Picasso's Chicago, or Chicago's Picasso. 
What do you think of Picasso? Like I says, I'd donate to have it removed. It's a difficult thing. It's been here, God knows, what, about 10 years? 12. 12 years. And when it went up, I think it was a super controversial thing. But it, it's become a part of Chicago. It's part of the Civic Center, and I couldn't see the Civic Center without it. It's, a, it's an astonishing piece. And I give thanks to it. It's a home for the birds, and it's a home for me. That's where I sleep at night. <laughs> it's just a beautiful thing, man. I don't know what it is, so, you know, whatever it is, it's nice. And what was Louis Sullivan's vision? Louis Sullivan, the Chicago architect, teacher of Frank Lloyd Wright, who called him Liebermeister. We're on the roof of the auditorium building, one floor above the office where Louis Sullivan practiced in the 1890s and early 1900s, I'll bet on a hot summer evening he was on this roof and looked around. And what did he see? I think he saw a culture, not a hawk cool tour for the few, but a patch of beauty for the great many men and women who worked and built the city. And what was in his mind's eye as he conceived the idea of the skyscraper? He simply said, it's tall, for he saw more than steel and stone. He saw it reaching toward the heavens, aspiring. Louis Sullivan saw Chicago as more than a city of things. He saw it, as he put it, as a city of man. Number one, State Street, corner Madison once known as the busiest corner in the world. Carson Peary's Scott Department Store, described as Louis Sullivan's jewel, the jewel in his crown. The ironwork, you might say, represents the vision of Sullivan, that this department store is more than vulgar commerce. When the woman shops, this is free turn of the century, she's surrounded by grace and beauty as well. Sullivan's dream. The city of man, more than the city of things. Riding the L, this is the means of transportation to and from work for hundreds of thousands of Chicago working people, five days, sometimes six days a week. Right now, we're looping the loop. The loop of Chicago is Chicago's name for downtown. When somebody says, I'm going down to the loop, that somebody means I'm going down where the action is, where the shopping is, where theaters are, where people walk. This is the loop. It's about eight blocks north to south, about six blocks east to west. Almost a square, you might say. The mathematician's dream, we're squaring the circle. For years, there's been talk about tearing down the train because of the sound, but the high decibel level, if anything, adds to the excitement of it. You know you're somewhere. There's been talk of tearing it down, just as there's been talk of tearing down the water tower, but both survived. Two old-time institutions of Chicago, survivors, the water tower and the loop, the L. Walking through Chicago's loop on a Saturday, it was always a festive day, morning, noon, or at night, seeing movies in those palaces. Today, mostly young black people in the loop and young working class white kids. And the movies are known as exploitation films. Kung Fu Mama, Buddha Rakasaki, Malibu High, Malibu Low. I remember June 1925, graduation day from McLaren Public School, my first pair of long pants, and I saw Cecil B. DeMille's version of the Bible. 
the Ten Commandments, Theodore Roberts. Talk about exploitation of the good book. And waited in line to see Al Jolson and Sonny Boy. Talk about exploitation of grief, death of a small boy, becoming ersatz, schlock sentimentality. I'm afraid, or perhaps happy, or perhaps non-committal. Plus a change, plus c'est la même chose. The more things change, baby, the more they're the same. Gliding along the Chicago River, it may not be your river of redeeming grace, but it is unique. As far as we know, it is the only body of water in the world that flows backwards. Instead of going that way, it goes that way. Back in the 30s, there was an epidemic, and there was a fear that the sewage of this river would flow into Lake Michigan that supplies our city with its drinking water. And so a corps of engineers performed a miracle of sorts. They reversed the flow of the river. It could only happen in Chicago. The bridges of this city are our blessing times our curse. We may have more bridges than, than Paris. You understand when progress of the city is held up as the bridge goes up, if a paper boat is going through, supplying the Chicago Tribune with its paper as well as the Sun-Times. And when a boat comes along, a freighter with heavy equipment, that's understandable. But when thousands of people are kept from going home or kept from going to work by that bridge up by one little sailboat going through with one mass up there and on that boat reclining in view of scores of thousands are quote unquote two beautiful people Florida tanned or Sardinia tanned and we look down below at them we're furious also jealous from Michigan Boulevard to the Outer Drive. This is the expressway that takes people to Chicago or back north home after a day's work. To my left here are all these high-rise buildings and as often cab drivers say to me, where does all this money come from? Now, generally, most people live here, I suspect, are young couples, both of whom are working, young professionals, and a good deal of that dough goes into rent. There's a sort of status symbol connected with it here. But most of these apartments, buildings, are all occupied. And indeed, you echo the thoughts of, of the uh, curbstone philosopher. Where does all this dough come from? <laughs> Does all the money come from? Ed Sitlowski, steelworker all his life, living in South Chicago, union organizer for a time, director of the largest district of the United Steelworkers of America. In the years when you first broke in about 20 years ago, yeah. and when your father worked before your grandfather, have conditions changed very much in the mill itself? From from that bull type of concept of sledgehammering and that, yeah, I'm not sure though that they haven't changed in some respects for the worse psychologically. Uh, today, uh, the industry has went through a tremendous degree of uh, technological change. Uh, the speed up is there in respect there that uh, a guy now is finding himself in positions and jobs that he's producing twice as much as he did a decade ago. Uh, even though things were supposedly automated is the fashionable term the guy is busting his butt in a lot of different ways, uh, mentally, and even in some respects physically. Uh, the job takes a lot out of you. It's a, it's a job that's very depressing, too. But, uh, it's a job that you feel just, well, look at this. You're just surrounded by 
massive machinery and fire and noise and dirt. Some areas of that steel mill you think you're stepping into the bowels of hell. Bells and sirens and fire, you just can't describe it. I'm nine years old, arriving in Chicago for the first time off the day coach. Straw suitcase in hand, LaSalle Street Station, one of the eight great depots of this city. Between the years 1920 and 1930, Chicago was the greatest railroad center the world has ever known. 3,000 trains stopped here daily. You could go to no American city of any size, transcontinentally, without stopping off in Chicago. As Sandberg put it, railroad center of the world, indeed it was, and I, at nine, was just overwhelmed. Nineteen twenty-one, riding the streetcar, three cents for a kid. Later on, the fare was a nickel. And later on, you know what? Chicago, coming out of the East in 1921, was that huge, big, rough town where so much was happening. Big Bill Thompson, flamboyant, colorful, crooked, was the mayor. And he said, throw away your hammer, pick up your horn. Coming off the streetcar, battered luggage in my hand, heading toward the Wells Grand Hotel, the place my mother bought near north side of Chicago, this was, where lived skilled craftsmen, retired railroad engineers, boomer firemen, cabinet makers, carpenters, all sorts of arguments, debates, up those golden stairs into that lobby. Here it was, up in that lobby, above those golden stairs. Men debated. They were skilled craftsmen, self-educated men. Boomer firemen, railroad engineers, retired carpenters, cabinet makers, all sorts of wild discussion, fueled by a drop of whiskey or two. Tom Paine, Jefferson, Voltaire, Aristotle. Wild, crazy, exhilarating talk. Memories that bless and burn. school parade on Chicago's south side two days after school is officially opened. The enrollment of Chicago public schools is about 400,000 students, 60% black, roughly 15% Latino. The first settler in Chicago was a black man, John Baptiste Pont de Sabre. The two big black migrations to Chicago from the deep south were post-World War I and post-World War II. The first one, people seeking work in the stockyards, railroads, steel mills, farm equipment. And the second one after World War II, people seeking just a better life generally. And here they come, their grandchildren, their children, their nieces, nephews, all back to school we trust, seeking some sort of recognition. Rob 
Robert Taylor Homes, the largest, most segregated housing project in the Western world. In appearance and feeling, asylums, orphanages, and prisons. Not a white face to be seen for miles around. Renault Robinson, a young South Side cop. He knows Robert Taylor Holmes like nobody's business. But he has a vision. He knows what Robert Taylor Holmes are, or what they can be for those who live in them. Okay, I have a feeling that we can reform this housing to the extent that we can make people whole again and give them a lease on life that they don't have now, which is something that's very important. If we give these people health care, perfect schools, all of the city services that they're supposed to receive, decent housing, good elevators, you know, the whole bit, what you end up with is less people who are plagued with problems and less problems on the government. We hear a lot about crime in the area. There's absolutely an incredible amount of crime in this area. And, and the reason that the crime is so great is because there is, the, the, on the part of the authorities, the police and other city agencies, there's no real focus on prevention. None. You know, if in the loop downtown, in other areas, there's a focus on prevention, right? There are, there are police officers on the corner, there are policemen walking the street, there are policemen stationed in places. Have you seen one policeman over here? And I'm saying that if folks had a decent opportunity for once, that they would, they would, they would be able to prosper. And that's going to happen. That's, that's something that, as a commissioner of public housing, I intend to see happen here. How sweet the sound. Amazing grace, how sweet thy sound, too often how bitter thy sound. The black church is more than just a place of worship. It's a gathering of people who've worked hard all week on this day to seek consolation, solace, and an airing of grievances. Seeking a piece of that dream that seems so hard to find. Amazing grace exhilarates the spirit, makes a joyful noise unto the Lord and unto themselves. It says, we indeed are somebody. This is the corner. This was the corner 
It is now 47th and Martin Luther King Jr. Drive. Once upon a time, this boulevard was called Grand and then South Parkway. This area, this space, this place was Champs-Élysées, Fifth Avenue, Broadway, all rolled into one for black Chicagoans. There was the Regal Theater Elegant, where Duke Ellington played appropriately enough, and Count Basie, Billy Holiday sang, Mom's Mabley brought laughter. On this corner, you could meet, if you were black, someone from your hometown, everybody, anybody. You were, on Saturday night, dressed in your Sunday best. But the one night I remember here on this corner was the time Joe Lewis knocked out Max Schmeling in the first round. This was Liberation Paris Day, Carnival Day, Emancipation Day, all rolled into one. People walked five feet above the pavement. There was literally dancing in the streets. There was embraceable you. You were offered drinks and barbecue. It was glorious. Of course, that was 1937. has been playing and singing the blues all his life. What is the blues? There's no one definition. There are as many as there are human experiences. The blues ain't nothing but a good man feeling bad. The blues is all the things I wanted to do and never got around to doing. The blues ain't nothing but a cold, gray day. The blues, the landlord knocking at the gate. The blues ain't nothing but a woman on a poor man's mind. Woke up this morning, blues was around my bed. Ate my breakfast, blues was in my bread. The blues, oh yeah, but the sun's gonna shine on my back door someday. The blues. One of these days, baby, find you done me wrong. We'll be too late, girl, poor John will be gone. So long, yeah, we'll go, baby, how long? <laughs> Coffee, please. Black. I remember the all-night restaurant just below my mother's hotel. It was Friday night, two o'clock in the morning. There was an old guy across the counter. His name was Boxcar Slim. He was having graveyard stew. That's toast dunked in a bowl of hot milk. Had no teeth. They were knocked out by some vigilantes in Seattle back in 1915. He was organizing the Wobblies. I was 11 years old, and I was having apple pie a la mode. And so it is, every time I visit the Art Institute, I pause right here and look and delight in Edward Hopper's vision of an all-night diner, Nighthawks. I see the same bone weariness tired night weariness of the free customers, the weary counterman, the shaft of light accentuating the loneliness. But mostly I see in my mind's eye a boy of 11 at Victoria restaurant number two 
at two o'clock in the morning, having apple pie a la mode. The Art Institute of Chicago, along with Edward Hopper and other American masters, is probably the greatest gathering of French Impressionist paintings in the world. I guess by far the most popular painting here is George Seurat's A Sunday Afternoon on the Grand Jatte. Now, what is it about this painting that attracts so many people? Is it its air of serenity, contentment? Visitors often stop off at Chicago for just this one reason, to see this painting. Rene Clair, the French film director, says, every time I go to America, I must stop off at your city to see La Grand Jette. It refreshes me, I need it. People often say, show me the picture with the dots. Sarah, hurrah. Sunday afternoon in the park, our grand shot. Here Chicagoans come to Lincoln Park along the lake in the heart of the city. Saturdays, Sundays, holidays to cool off. Here they come to seek respite from the factories, the schoolrooms, the offices, to find the same kind of serenity and peace that Georges Seurat's Parisians did in his day. And here, too, are these seraphim, these fish, these swans, offering us just that delicate spray of coolness to comfort our fevered brows. And you wonder, how long can they maintain that pose? They've been standing that way for years. In any event, they and this greenery sure help the weak go faster. Well, Sunday morning, Chicago's open market, Maxwell Street. Years ago, this was blocks and blocks, miles and miles, wall-to-wall -wall people. Now expressways have cut the heart out of it, and yet there's still life on these old blocks. Here, you can buy anything. Anything you want, whether a used bicycle tire, a hot wristwatch, a half dozen bananas. Chacun a son goût. Each to his own taste, buddy. Here you hear the sounds of street singers and hawkers unabashedly peddling their wares. This is no suburban supermarket. These are the few remaining small entrepreneurs at work. And here you have a young a young Horatio Alger over there. Boots socks, pajamas. Anything you want. This is Maxwell Street. And the people who come here haven't uh, changed much here and there. More, more black people today and Latino than there were in the past. But uh, there's still people, whether it be new arrivals to Chicago, mostly yeah, a young couple now and then want to pick up a bargain. We used to have the pullers. They seem to be gone. We don't hear those sounds of the pullers. The guy says, hey, you look good. Come on in. I got a suit just to fit you. And of course, you're in it whether you want to be or not. Underwear, t-shirt, socks. From the deep south and the Appalachians came the poor whites too, seeking a piece of that dream. 
Peggy Terry, out of Kentucky, has lived in Chicago several years, and she speaks the thoughts of so many mountain people. People, people are beautiful. And I, I think the more they are themselves, the more beautiful they are. And the more they pretend to be somebody else, the, the more strained and artificial they are. But I think people are most beautiful when they're being themselves. And the Southerners just have a way, because I'm a Southerner and I'm prejudiced, but I, I love to hear them talk. And once they get over being ashamed, they talk, they say such beautiful things. Like one of the meetings we went to, we would fight in the park district to get a park here on Clifton. They tried to make us, tried to use race prejudice. And this quiet little hillbilly woman who never said anything to anybody, she stands up and they, they were telling us that they didn't have any money for a park in this neighborhood because they'd given it to black people on the south and west side. And she stood up and she said, well, you may not think I know it, but I know what you're doing to us. She said, you're just trying to set the and the hillbillies against each other. And she said, if it's a riot you want, us hillbillies can work you up a good one. And we all sat there just amazed. We wouldn't even look at anybody because this was a quiet little woman who, not very sure of herself, but when they discover their own beauty and their own worth, and the most amazing things happen. They're, they're not afraid of anybody. of love, the place burned down, yet it's a city where places are built, maintained. From Eastern Europe at the turn of the century, and recently, came the farmers, the peasants, the villagers, seeking that old familiar feeling, that old familiar place. They found it in neighborhoods amongst their own people. Though many of these communities have vanished, flight to the suburbs, stubbornly, obstinately, a good number are maintained and kept. A home away from home. You may be dead, but I'll pay the price. Our love is gone, there's no doubt. Ashes of love, the flames burn down. Chicago is a city of bungalows. On this street, in this neighborhood, are these stucco frame brick tidy little houses. Here live the sons and grandsons, granddaughters, daughters of people from the old country, the immigrants who came here seeking that better life. Often they've worked on that same job for one company. They have these houses, that was the dream. A house of your own, a piece of land. And of course, a little bit of shrubbery, that lawn well kept, well manicured. Preferably living among people of their own kind. On occasion, a suspicion of strangers, but more often than not, a generosity of spirit, an open-heartedness, a hospitality. Chicago is no one-dimensional town, nor are its people. No, senora, Chicago is more than that, much more. And we're climbing Jacob's Ladder, one more rung upward toward that blue of security, to own a two-flat. Your piece of land, but you're a landlord as well. On the first floor, you and your family live. Up above, maybe your son-in-law, father-in-law and family, stranger, and you're getting rent. But always a little patch of green, if possible, and perhaps a little garden, a flower or two, in that quietly desperate search for just a little piece of beauty in our daily lives.
Look homeward, Angel. Thomas Wolfe, as Eugene Gant, offered us his vision of his father's vision. Old W. Gant, the Asheville, North Carolina stonecutter, and his quest for beauty, his never-ending quest. And so does Mario Anakini, who came to this corner on Ohio and Wells, a block from the Wells Grand Hotel from Tuscany about a half a century ago. And he had a quest. He had a dream, never-ending here in Chicago. Oh, lost and by the wind-grieved ghost, come back again. <laughs> A mural in the street. We call it wall art in Chicago. It's in every community of town. We're now in a primarily Chicano and Puerto Rican community. And this is the work of young people living on this block or in the area nearby. They did it themselves. Now, they probably never heard of uh, Diego Rivera or Orozco, but what they tell us is, behold, our vision, our quest. We know about uh, vandalism in large cities all over the world, defacement of walls. There is no record of any defacement of any work of wall art in Chicago. The reason is quite simple. Their pride in their art and in themselves. We're at Sox Park, Friday night, it's near the end of the season. Neither they nor the visiting team, the Oakland A's, are going anywhere, to put it mildly. Uh, the people in the audience, up in the night out, Sox fans, with their wives and kids, primarily blue-collar people who bought season tickets here, and it's... Uh, if I would describe the Sox, I would describe Chicago, really. It's a ragamuffin sort of team, which, if anything, adds to its charm. It isn't a question of death if they lose tonight, and they've lost quite often. They've died a thousand deaths this season. Nor is it a question of their winning. It's a question of a night out, and when someone in the Sox hits a home run, the lights go on and the band does play Dixie. in the lives not only of the Sox player hit the home run, but of the fans here too. And to me, the memory of my visiting Sox Park is often way out there in the bleachers. They're the lowest price seats. And I remember the old time fan seater there, Heavy, a guy named Heavy, a retired construction worker, Wally the musician, a guy named Zaza, who never looked at the ballpark. He was always looking at his colleagues making bets. And a friend of mine, Bill Leonard, once said, the same 50 bucks passed hands the entire season. And if some sock played in an era, Heavy would say, same old soup warmed over. Zaza was a very tempestuous, a very volatile Sox fan. And when they got a new player, one day they made a trade, and the player wasn't on the field for some reason. Zaza called out, see that? They got themselves a bump. And someone in the audience, someone in the bleachers said, oh, the guy's sick, don't you know? He's, he's sick. Oh, what a wonderful guy. So when I think of the Sox tonight, with the attendance rather sparse, I think of Chicago, too. 
So, we lose one, we win one, and if we win, our team wins, let that be triumph enough. And that's what they're witnessing tonight. Small triumphs after a hard week of work. Chicago was always a hot newspaper town. When I arrived in 21, there were at least eight. Now the only two, but there still are mementos of past glories. Get to final, get to final. The Tribune Tower, the domain of that storied Chicago publisher, the one and only Colonel Robert R. McCormick. He wanted an edifice that would symbolize the world's greatest newspaper. There was a contest of eminent architects the world over, and he chose that, a study in ersatz Gothic. A member of his court fondly remembers him as the benevolent duke in a village of peasants. It was indeed the Chicago Tribune, a journal of opinion, and opinionated, in no uncertain terms, was the colonel. He damned Franklin Delano Roosevelt and King George with equal fervor. If ever there were a symbol of Chicago, the Tribune Tower. Chicago's loop at the end of a hard day's work, thousands of them all going home by way of the L that may or may not be stuck over there on occasion that happens. This is the hour of night that indicates Chicago as a city in motion, but more than that, a working city always. These are mostly white collar people, of course, coming out of the offices on the outskirts of town and the other precincts you have, the blue collars. They're heading home. All going, it seems, in opposite directions. Some going toward the northern suburbs, these be the executives, others blue collar, perhaps heading toward the west and the south. No one rule, again, the multi-dimensional aspect of a city in motion. Yes, hello, baby, hello. Have that evening, train been gone. Too long, so long, baby. To some people, Chicago, with its lack of sophistication and muscularity, is comical, archaic in this cool era. Somewhat like a old, punch-drunk price fighter swinging wild roundhouse wallops to the laughter of the Weisenheimers on the sidelines. But when he connects, oh, baby, as Nelson Aldrin put it, in order to wrap any sort of joint, you have to love it a little while its alleys as well as its boulevards. He said, Chicago's rusty heart has room for both the hustler and the square. Keeps them and holds them both for keeps and a single day. He speaks for me too. And so, if I were ever to meet that old signora in that North Italian town, and she were to say to me, Chicago, boom, 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 I'd say, oh no, signora, no, no. Chicago is more than that, much more.